as you sit here trying to find a comfortable way to breathe. Don't be afraid of enjoying the pleasure that comes when you found something that feels really good. After all, one of the factors of right concentration in the first jhana and the second jhana, and the third jhana is pleasure. The first two jhanas have a sense of rapture. In all cases, you want that sense of pleasure and rapture to spread and permeate the whole body. The passages of the Buddha talks about allowing yourself to settle into the sense of pleasure, to indulge in it. Because the, the pleasure of concentration is something different from ordinary sensory pleasures. They're the sensory pleasures of things you feel coming in through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, things that make contact with the body. That's called sensual pleasure. Then there's the pleasure of form. And that's the pleasure that you can feel simply by inhabiting your body in a way that feels comfortable. And that's on a higher level. We know that the path is supposed to avoid two extremes. On the one side, indulgence in self-affliction, and the other side, indulgence in sensory pleasure, or sensual pleasure, indulgence in sensuality. We'll notice that this kind of pleasure, the pleasure of inhabiting the body with good breath energy, and you're inhabiting the body, is a different kind of pleasure. And so it doesn't fall into that extreme. The Buddha chose his words carefully. And you know the story of how he came to this conclusion. He'd had a vision. Of wood. In one case of wood, wood was lying in the water, another it was lying outside of the water but it was still wet. And the third one was lying outside of the water, but it was dried. And the water there stood for sensual pleasure. And he read the vision in the wrong way. He figured that if any pleasure at all was represented by the water, and so he had to avoid all pleasures if he wanted his mind to be able to take fire with enlightenment just as only dry wood far from the water would be able to, would, you could use to give rise to a fire. And as a result, he endured six long years of self-torture. When he finally realized that that was going nowhere, then he stopped to ask himself, was there possibly another way? And then he recalled, as a child, having sat under a tree and spontaneously entered the first jhana, Sometimes you hear that he gained a sense of oneness with the universe and realized that the path he was looking for was the path of just returning to that childlike oneness. Well, that's not the case. It's not what he realized. It's amazing how these stories get distorted. He simply entered the first jhana with pleasure and rapture permeating the body. And he asked himself, could this be the way? There was an awareness that, yes, this could be the way. And then he pursued it and found that it actually was the way. But before pursuing it, he asked himself, well, why am I afraid of this pleasure? After all, it is blameless. It doesn't require that you take anything away from anyone else. And the type of attachment is a very different type of attachment. Because when you're immersed in sensual pleasures, it's very hard to gain discernment. But when you're staying with this kind of pleasure, discernment arises more easy, easily. In fact, this is where discernment arises. It's this power of concentration that allows the mind to settle down and be still and to have a sense of well-being. The mind lacks a sense of well-being. Whatever insights it has, it has are going to be distorted based on aversion. But when the mind has this sense of pleasure, it's like a person who's eaten well, rested well, is in a good mood. You can talk to that person about their failings, and are much less likely to take offense and actually be willing to listen. It's the same with the mind, because a lot of the lessons we're going to learn from discernment are where the mind's been stupid, telling itself things that it really deep down knows are not true, acting on intentions that it knows are unskillful. 
sort of get the mind willing to admit its mistakes. You've got to get it in a good mood. This is one of the things that concentration does. Both the steadiness and the sense of well-being are really important for the arising of discernment, so you can see what's actually going on in the mind. And at the same time, as you're working on concentration, you're dealing with the processes of fabrication. You're getting hands-on practice with how you can use the rhythm and texture of breathing to have an influence on how you sense the body, how you use the power of verbal fabrication, in other words, directing your thoughts to the breath and evaluating the breath, to give rise to feelings of pleasure, how you use the perceptions of the breath to create a sense of well-being in the mind. You're working directly with fabrication. It's precisely fabrication that you're trying to get discernment into. So all these are good reasons why strong concentration, right concentration, is an important part of the path. In fact, there's one part where the Buddha actually calls all the other elements of the path supports and requisites for right concentration, right concentration being the heart of the path. There's another place where he compares concentration to food and a fortress. You've got the soldiers of right effort, you've got the weapons of your learning and knowledge. You've got a gatekeeper at the gate, i.e. mindfulness, who knows how to recognize who should be allowed into the fortress and who shouldn't. In other words, who knows what skillful qualities should be encouraged in the mind and which unskillful qualities should be abandoned. Well, the soldiers and the gatekeeper need food, and that's what concentration is for. And so in this way, the concentration helps provide protection. It's kind of perverse that you hear concentration being referred to as dangerous. So many places you know, don't get involved in concentration, stay away from jhana because you get stuck on it and you never get unstuck. Well, that's, not, that's not the case. You will get stuck on it, but there's healthy attachment. And it's not the case that you can't let go. There are some people who are unhealthy to begin with will latch on to anything and will develop an unhealthy attachment to concentration. But primarily it's if you approach it with just a little bit of discernment even. You know, okay, this is not the end of the path, but it's an important element to get you to the end. But without it, you can't get there. You can't get to any of the noble attainments. There are much greater dangers than being attached to sensual pleasures, and that's what usually happens if you don't have this pleasure from concentration. As the Buddha said, you're not going to be able to pry yourself away from your attachment to sensual pleasures. And what do people do when they're attached to sensual pleasures? All kinds of unskillful things. And this is why people break the five precepts. But nobody breaks the five precepts over attachment to jhana. And there's even the greater danger that comes when people are told that they've attained some level of awakening and they haven't gotten anywhere near. That's a danger that goes unmentioned. As the Buddha said, it's not automatic that when you attain concentration that the mind is going to be ready to let go of its ignorance or its self-identification. So that is one danger. In other words, you get satisfied here and you don't want to go any further. But that's such a mild danger compared to people who are blatantly doing unskillful things, or people who've been told that they've tasted the deathless and it wasn't much of a big deal. And so they tend to dismiss it. That's a lot more dangerous because that cuts off all the possibility of actually attaining the deathless. Whereas attachment to concentration is something that can be dealt with. When you begin to realize that it's not as totally free from stress as you may have originally thought, you begin to see there's something a little bit wrong with it. 
It has its ups and downs, even in the highest levels of concentration you can manage. And if you're really looking for a reliable happiness, you want something better than this. So don't be afraid of the pleasure of concentration. Allow yourself to develop a healthy attachment to it. As a John Fuang used to say, you have to be really crazy about concentration to do it well. Finding ways of staying with the breath, regardless of what your activities are, wherever you are. That kind of commitment is actually necessary. And don't be afraid of enjoying it. Indulgence, as the Buddha said, is an important part of really getting into the concentration. Simply realize that it's part of the path. It's not the goal. And it is a higher level of pleasure from sensual pleasures. This pleasure of form. And this is the kind of pleasure that the Brahma, that the Brahmas experience. So don't be afraid of concentration, because you need it. It's a necessary part of the path.